Hello, welcome to episode 127 of the Craft House Magic Podcast. My name's Ellie and I'm coming to you from Norwich in Norfolk in the UK and today is the 6th of August. So welcome everybody. I hope you've all had a lovely crafty week and I'm here to share all the things that I've been making in the last seven days. So today I have some knitting, some sewing, some embroidery. I have a confession. <laughs> just once so it's not too bad a question from the ask me anything thread and some information on my shop update the shop update will be this friday at 7 p.m british summer time and i'm going to have some new scissors in there among other things so do stay till the end of the podcast if you want to find out what's going in the shop so you can find me on Instagram, Ravelry and Facebook as Craft House Magic and I have my own website crafthousemagic.co.uk where you can find my handmade project bags, hand-dyed yarns, stitch markers, higher higher knitting needles, fabrics and also bag making supplies. So we also have the summer sock along going on in the Ravelry group at the moment. Everybody is knitting so many lovely, lovely socks. It can be any adult sock pattern, shorties, knee highs, whatever you like. Come and join in the discussion thread. Also include your finished objects thread in the discussion thread as well, because I'll be drawing prizes from the one thread so that you don't have to finish. It's just taking part that matters. Although it is nice to finish some socks too. <laughs> so the lovely Shannon from Blue Fern Yarns has donated the most gorgeous prize for the summer sock along. It is a full skein of watermelon colourway and that's a merino and nylon um, sort of sock yarn. And then we have a 20 gram mini and this is in the conifer colourway. But aren't they gorgeous? And you also get a little progress keeper that she's included there. Um, to show you the full colours on the watermelon sock yarn isn't that lovely so and the little mini's called conifer so that's a lovely prize thank you so much shannon for those so let's get on with the knitting shall we so first of all i have a finished object to show you and these socks are the vanilla is the new black sock pattern and the pattern's by hannah fletcher and it's a really interesting sort of ribbed heel here and it gives quite a nice deep space so if you've got a high instep that's ideal so I've knitted the complete pair now and they're knitted from a sock blank that I've dyed and I do have some in the shop if you're interested and I haven't actually named it I should have named it after uh, a song like I normally do for some reason I've just called it sock blank <laughs> just to see how they sort of go so there we go so that's the vanilla is the new black socks and my sock blank and you can see that I have blocked them they are very slightly wiggly still but I think that might be because these sock blanks aren't really big enough to stretch um, the socks round the leg really I need I could do with getting some larger ones as well so I'm really pleased to have finished those though I think that they're really pretty you can see close up there's sort of a watercolor effect with it being knitted from a sock blank and I shall show you the heel close up so it gives um, an interesting pattern on the back of the heel um, gives you quite a lot of space in the instep there I look like I'm <laughs> I'm holding a sock puppet here but you get the idea it's quite nice because there's no picking up stitches and you've just got some short rows at the bottom I definitely knit this pattern again and this is actually the second pair that I've knitted of this pattern already so it was a little while ago I knitted out of a pair but there we go finish object Ta -da! right so we have a couple of cast ons to show you now I don't have a lot of this knitting to show you on these two but at least you'll be able to see what I've started so the first of my works in progress is the Fraxinus cowl and this is the front cover for the pattern and you can see the cowl just there it's a particularly good photograph of the cowl itself to be honest you can see that there's some cable details on there and I've just started the cast on really and I'm using this gorgeous yarn and I picked this up when I was over in Florida and actually it's actually a Canadian yarn and it's called Richard Devires I think that's how you pronounce it but it is this gorgeous sort of pinky red and this the label Richard Devires I think I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it but the actual colourway is called she's here she's here so I've no idea what that means does anybody know <laughs> but it is a gorgeous yarn and you can see that I've actually caked this up using my new ball winder which I think 
gives them a, a lovely neat effect i have wrapped it around a bit so it spoils the effect a bit but you get the idea and i've knitted <laughs> this much so far so it's not a lot so that's how it's looking so far i'm basically just doing the rib edge um, but I haven't got very far so I'm knitting this on 3.75 millimeter needles and it's a 60 centimeter cable um, as suggested in the pattern and it's quite an easy knit so far there are some cables in it but I don't think that they're going to be too difficult I normally find cables relatively straightforward so I'm looking forward to getting to the cable bits so that's project cast on number one for this week and I have cast on a second project. So a couple of weeks ago or maybe last week I talked about the Black Cable Socks by Hannah Fletcher which is also a pattern by the same writer as the Vanilla is the New Black Socks. So I decided to cast these on as well because they've got the most gorgeous cables and I thought that I needed a uh, tonal yarn to really make the most of these cables. I've gone cable mad this week. So I chose this yarn that I've had in my stash a little while, but I actually don't have the label to it. I remember I bought it from Yarningham last year and there wasn't a label on it when I bought it, so I don't remember what it is. I will go back on to my video for Yarningham last year and see if I can work out what company dyed this yarn. But it is a hand dyed BFL base and I've just started a tiny little moustache. <laughs> and that's how it looks close up it's basically just a two by two rib again so basically this podcast is all about just two by two rib this week i'm afraid <laughs> once i get into the pattern a bit it'll be a bit more exciting and i will pop a picture up here so that you can see what the sock pattern looks like in full but it's got some gorgeous cables and interesting shaping similar to the shaping of this one around the heel so i thought it might be quite exciting to try it out um, but at least I've made a start and I'm using a 60 centimeter cable and 2.5 millimeter needles and these are the in interchangeable sock miniature needles that I sell in my shop from higher higher which I really like they are a softer cable than the standard higher higher cable so if you find that the the normal standard cables are a bit too stiff this is really soft and supple and it's really nice to have the interchangeable smaller needles as well and they're listed under the miniature higher higher needles in my shop and that you can get the cables and the tips in the same listing you just select a different one from the drop bar so those are on the needles ready to go and adam has already decided that they're for him <laughs> even though he's got loads of socks in fact he's got more socks than i have like hand hand knitted ones anyway oh dear <laughs> so that is all the knitting that i've got to show you this week but i do have some dressmaking so i'm going to get barbara to come over and show you what i've made this week barbara would you like to come over thank you very much barbara so this week barbara is wearing my megan nielsen darling ranges dress which i've made this week and it is very reminiscent of the 80s and 90s, I think, with the sort of non-collared neckline and button-down front. This sort of shape reminds me of the early 90s, I think. When I, when I saw this pattern, I really wanted to make a really nice sort of blue chambray version, like it had on the pattern envelope, or like a grey chambray, just a plain. But I wanted to try it out in some fabric that I've already got in my stash to see how it fits first. And this fabric is a viscose twill fabric and it is just a very drapey fabric but with a bit because it's a twill it's slightly sort of heavier weight so it is more ideal for autumn really but i just i'm excited in the middle of summer and i needed to make an autumnal dress <laughs> i'm going with the inspiration at the moment so the Darling Ranges dress is one of the curve range in the Megan Nielsen dress patterns and it means that the size range is much bigger than some of their older patterns. So the curve range actually goes up to a size 30, so that's brilliant. Lovely to be size inclusive, so they go from a size 0 right up to a size 30. I purchased the curved version of the dress which meant I got not only the sizes 0 to 20 in one file but the sizes 14 to 30 as well so if you were a bit concerned as to what which one to buy you actually get all the sizes with the curve range which is brilliant and it's so nice that so many of these pattern companies are being more size inclusive to right up to a size 30 and down to a size 0 so that's brilliant 
I think I cut about a size 22, I think, from what I recall, um, and a smaller size over the shoulders. I think for, I went for a size 16, but I did use my pattern block that I'd already drafted out onto cardboard and I just placed that over the pattern pieces to choose which size I wanted for me and it just gives me a peace of mind and makes it easier to select what size I like and I used a pattern cutting book because I went on a course how to do this um, to set up this block and I use this all the time now to make sure all the patterns that I'm making are easy to fit. So, Darling Ranger's dress is basically just past my knee, the length of the skirt, and the cuffs come to just about there. There are There is a shorter sleeve option, as well as the shirt version of the top, and also like a shirt sort of dress where there isn't this gathering, it's just sort of straight down. But I really liked the gathered version. And if you look at the back, there is a little tie. So this is a little bit unusual from what I'd made before because the ties are actually attached here and here rather than coming from the waist just which is right round here so you don't have to tie, you don't have to cut such a large tie. So the pattern is actually designed to be quite roomy so I sort of followed that concept and kept it to be quite large around the sides here so that then I can just pull it a little bit tighter around the back to show that I've got a waistline if that makes sense. The dress is buttoned all the way to the bottom so you can unbutton it if you want to but I did actually do some tacking stitches just there um, over where I'd stitched the button placket to keep it closed because I found where I placed the buttons it was gaping very slightly not loads and it's not because it's very tight it's just the way that the fabric was laying so I just did some stitches down there just to secure it to make sure that I know that I'm not going to be flashing anybody because you wouldn't want that oh dear <laughs> I did I know that you I could have moved the button placement so that it was more in line with where my bust apex was so where the fullest part of my bust I'd needed to put the button about here but I think that the aesthetic appeal of having those simple three buttons looks really nice so I went for just doing some stitches over the button placket so you can't really see where it is. So like I said it's gathered all the way around on the waistline all the way around the back as well and then you basically add these ties at the end and top stitch them on and you stitch a little box over the end of the tab so that you've got these ties. I'll just undo them so you can see um, but you can leave them hanging if you want to if you want to be nice and airy and roomy but I do like it tied up just because it gives me a little bit of waist definition. I love these sleeves, how they stop here. I think that's really flattering and a really comfortable sort of shape. And I love this sort of 80s or 90s button placket style that like, gives this smooth edge. This goes to about just the perfect position so it's not too low but it it just gives a lovely um, silhouette around the neckline which I love so I will pop some pictures of me twirling the garden here so that you can see what it looks like on a real body and then I shall show you the inside thank you very much Barbara So I can show you the fabric a little bit closer up. 
So here we are, it's like a ditzy floral print, which really reminds me of the 90s sort of dresses, but I love it anyway. So this is a viscose twill, so there is, there is a line in the weave, I don't, I'm not quite sure whether you can really see um, with me holding it up like this, but it is quite a nice drapey, uh, slightly heavier weight viscose, but it's still quite fine. I think viscose is relatively breathable anyway. We have quite a turn up on the bottom of the skirt, so it did bring that length of the skirt up a little bit. I didn't shorten it at all, because normally, because I'm only five foot three, I need to shorten things by a few inches, but I thought, actually, I'd, I'd, looking at the pictures, I could do with it being slightly longer, maybe, just to cover my knees a bit. But I really like the length, now I've turned it up, um, I think it must have been about five centimetres. Let's turn it to the inside. So on the inside, it's bound with bias tape at the, around the neckline, and then you have the placket, which is just turned over by uh, folding over some of the front bodice and skirt, of course, because the placket goes right the way down um, the length of the skirt. It does have some bust starts there, you can see. I've stitched this in the overlock thread I've used is a grey because I thought that sort of went with the back of the fabric quite well because it is it isn't um it is printed on the front rather than a dyed fabric and then I've used a navy thread to stitch the actual garment so when I did the cuffs that gets you in to insert a piece of elastic in here and I've actually used nine millimeter elastic instead of the six millimeters that I asked that the pattern asked for so it is a little bit wider than it should be but it's just what I had in my stash and I thought for a sort of wearable twirl it is ideal just to use what you have really oh I forgot to say it has pockets love these pockets um, they're quite a nice big deep pocket not sure because I haven't worn it properly yet but they might be slightly on the low side for me just because I'm quite short I think but I can always modify that in the second version I make so I do I'm, I'm really pleased with the shape of this I would be tempted to do a shorter sleeve version I think the one the pattern gives you a shorter sleeve option but it is sort of to here I think I'd quite like one to this length rather than being sort of halfway down here I'm not keen on those mid-length sleeves so we'll see I shall see what sort of versions I come up with but I do really like it and I'm pleased that there's some lovely big pockets in there that is always ideal so now we're on to the embroidery section. So I've been really enjoying doing my embroidery pattern that was a free pattern by Diana Vingert. I thought I'd talk a bit more about how I sort of traced out the pattern as well. So this pattern was a free pattern from the Diane Vinger website. I will leave a link in the down bar to the website um, as well as the video tutorial that she's got. In Diana's tutorial she normally uses carbon paper to transfer the pattern onto the fabric but because I didn't have any that well I've got some but it's too old to actually work so I thought I'm going to just tape this pattern onto the window put my fabric over the top and then obviously the sunlight coming through you can see the lines and I can trace it nicely and I used one of the pens that is heat erasable just in case some of that pen shows outside of my stitching and then I can use some steam to get rid of that um, those marks afterwards. I would recommend testing these pens on the fabric before you actually um, do it on a large area just because sometimes they don't always come out with the heat on certain fabrics. So it's really nice and easy to follow. So this this printout is just an A4 printout from her website. I have actually finished the embroidery section. So I have actually finished the embroidery. I need to give it a bit of a press really, but that's how the embroidery looks so far. I finished all of the flowers. I'm not so keen on this style of flower here. I have made mine a little bit less sticky outy because I was worried that this was going to be a clock that it might interfere with the hands on the clock. But again, these roses, they're quite sticky outy as well. So we'll just have to see. I can always modify the clock so that um, 
the hands stick away from the face of the clock a bit more I think well this is what Adam tells me he's going to help me to do anyway so I have a picture here of what the clock looked like before and I picked it up from a charity shop for two pounds and I've always had in my head that this is what I wanted to do with this clock take the back off and have some embroidery behind it instead I have now painted the frame bluey grey so that this will go much nicer on the inside I think the colour the original colour was a sort of a yellowy colour and it looked a little bit sort of dirty even though I'd cleaned it so I thought it does need a fresh lick of paint just to improve the aesthetic of it and I've taken the hands off the centre of the clock and I'm going to wrap around the embroidery and because there's a mechanism here I need to make a hole in the embroidery as well but I was a little bit nervous about making a hole in my embroidery to make sure that it's in exactly the right place so I it was quite late at the weekend and I thought well, I'm just going to leave it till next weekend until I do the last scary bits I'm going to overlock in a circle all around the fabric and then tack stitch all the way around and draw it in around the back of the clock mechanism and obviously I've all made a hole in the centre and use some fray check on it to stop it fraying and then I'll be able to put it inside this frame so it'll look something like that and I think it'll go with our living room quite well because it's sort of cream and blues in there so I'm really chuffed about that so I'll give you another look at the embroidery so I did change the colours from what it said in the original pattern I've chosen to include some blues in the flowers as well as the creams just to give it a little pop of colour. I tried to choose colours that were similar in terms of these leaves because I thought that those were a lovely feature but I basically just use what threads I had in my stash. I will show you the back. I started off doing a really good job of making the back really neat with all the leaves, keeping those all separate. And then when I was doing all the other little bits and bobs, the French knots and things, it looked a little bit messy because the way I was traveling from one place to another, but it's not too bad. I try and keep it as neat as possible on the back because I think it helps keep it flat as well. Diana's style is using more threads with the embroidery to give it a lot of texture so I thought it'd be interesting to just try this new sort of new to me style embroidery. It is actually geared towards people who are just beginning embroidery so if you haven't done any embroidery before do go over and check Diana's patterns out and video tutorials because they are really helpful. This particular one was a free one but she has a lot of uh, other ones there that are paid for which I'm going to definitely do at least a couple more of because she's got a lovely style and I like the fact that it is quite thick and textured so that if you do have it up on the wall you can still see some sort of textured detail without it being lost um, because it's sort of high up on the wall really so I'll definitely be doing some more of those. So that's my embroidery section. I have some confessions next. So I had seen that Emma from the Vintage Sewing Box has released her gorgeous sewing box pattern, which is a hexagon shape with little hexagon decorations. And I'll pop some pictures up here so you can see what it looks like. So I thought I'm going to have to do this. So I contacted Emma about, do you need to use foam for it? So I said, can I buy some off you because I don't really know what to get and I think she's now producing kits so that you can um, actually purchase the foam or the things that you need directly from Emma so you, that you know exactly what to get rather than panicking and looking at all sorts of shops so I have my foam now <laughs> so I'm very excited to start my little hexagon box it's so beautiful Emma has got the most gorgeous designs I thought I'd put get this out so this is one of her designs that I completed a few weeks ago um, and this is another of her patterns that she sells on her website as well so I just thought it was so well thought out and I really enjoyed making this so I'm going to be doing another one of Emma's patterns this lovely box so I'm really excited about that right so that's my that's my confessions for this week okay so I've got the question from the ask me anything threads next and it is from KJ Louise and she was saying that she's got a Viking machine that is an overlocker and a cover stitch machine all in one and that she finds it sensitive to fabrics and doesn't sew consistently and she was wondering what machine I have and whether I'd recommend that one so I haven't ever used any other cover stitch machine bar this one in you know 
I've tried some in showrooms and things but not properly used it at home so I'm not quite sure whether the really expensive ones do work a lot better or not but when I've tried a couple of sort of seven eight hundred pound machines in showrooms they did seem to be really quite nice and good so i've tried one of the juki cover stitch machines i think um and then one of the faff ones as well in showrooms but i thought they were a bit expensive to me to fork out for another separate machine so i ended up buying the bernina burnett b42 machine which was about 400 pounds which is quite a lot less than any of the others but it is a specific cover stitch machine rather than having to convert it so i don't know whether converting it would be a bit more of a faff or cause you more trouble having that ability to convert um, compared to a machine that's just a cover stitch if you have any experiences with your cover stitch machine whether you think one machine is better than another do drop us a comment down below it'll be lovely to see what everyone's opinion is over cover stitch machines i've been using my cover stitch machine for over a year now and it did take me quite a while to get used to it so i found that to begin with if you've got quite a thick fabric it was very sort of fussy about how to run the fabric through i found that i had to reduce the pressure foot tension quite a lot to and i tend to use that pressure foot tension for most fabrics that i use if it is a very slippy fabric it is a bit of a pain to cover stitch over where you're if you've got the hem of a top for instance and you've got the seams at the sides and it's a little bit thicker if it's a very slippy material getting over that lumpy bit is sometimes a bit of a pain so on some materials i'll just stitch a line of stitches just over that lumpy bit just to squash it down a bit just using my standard machine before i run it over the cover stitch so whether that is a problem that a lot of people have or whether it's because perhaps if you've not spent so much on a machine or one that's it's a converted or a, a machine that you can convert from one to another whether that's an issue as well but it took me quite a while to get to grips with making sure i'd got everything all threaded perfectly so quite often if if something wasn't stitching correctly it'd be due to um there's little forks that hold the separate threads um, from crossing over one another and actually if the threads weren't in those holes it wouldn't stitch properly so I just now eyeball all where it's threading through just to make sure that it's threaded correctly each time I go to use it and I do find that when I'm pushing fabric through it or not pushing but when I'm guiding fabric through the machine I have to be more careful than any of my other machines in terms of making sure that it's straight because it doesn't want to guide the fabric in straight itself my overlocker for instance it'll suck the fabric sort of in and it's almost impossible for it not to be straight but the cover stitch machine is more difficult to control so I definitely find that using a cover stitch machine is a bit of trial and error really. It's not for somebody who isn't willing to put that bit of extra time in. I It may be that more expensive machines or better machines doesn't necessarily mean they're more expensive I suppose. But um, I certainly found it was a bit of trial and error. But if you have some experiences with your cover stitch machine or some information because you've used several machines of what to buy, which ones to go for... I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say if you comment down below. So last of all I have my shop update but I'm so excited to show you these new scissors that I picked up from Higher Higher and these will be stocked in the shop from this Friday at 7pm British summer time and they are gorgeous. I'm keeping it a set of each of these for me I think. <laughs> so the first one I've got to show you is the guitar and oh my goodness I'm using the foam that I bought. <laughs> as a background so that you can see them a little bit better but it is the most gorgeous rainbow material and they're sort of a matte satin matte maybe and absolutely beautiful scissors in a shape of a guitar um, how brilliant i've never seen guitar shaped scissors before so i've got guitar ones so these ones are the art deco version and these have got a large hole in as well which is rather lovely with a nice sharp tip um absolutely love these good for embroidery as well i have the butterfly version how cute So the butterfly and the art deco style 
are both quite a short sort of embroidery tip to the scissors so these would be great for embroidery as well as sort of knitting and crochet and then last but not least i have a unicorn pair <laughs> so the unicorn and the guitar i've got a slightly longer tip on the scissors i'd say that the unicorn is probably the least sharp out of all of them but they're still relatively sharp look you can see his little legs moving as you open the scissors <laughs> how cute are those so that's the unicorn ones and i'm going to show you the comparison of the different tips so the butterfly and the art deco ones are quite a, a short very sort of embroidery scissor like tip and then the guitar is slightly longer and then you've got the unicorn tip which is even longer so those are sort of you can sort of choose according to your theme or preference in terms of length of tip as well absolutely love all of these so i'm very excited to introduce those to the shop i've tried them all in my scissor cases and they all fit obviously you've got a difference in length between the butterfly compared to the unicorn for instance but it just doesn't go down into the scissor case as deep um, the butterfly one and this one goes right to the bottom but they all fit into my scissor cases so i'm going to be offering them um so you can purchase them on their own but also you, you can actually have those in all the scissor kits i sell in my shop as well so they'll be the same price as my other scissors which i shall show you so these scissors all fit into my scissor cases that i have in my shop this is a swallow version so they all go and fit nicely into the scissor case obviously the ones with the butterfly they're not as long so they won't go so deep into the case but because they're quite wide they fit nicely into the top section there there's the guitar one and the art deco style and they all fit nicely so these are the original ones that i've been selling for some time they're from by millward so these are the scissors that i've been selling for a while these are millward scissors in a rose gold material and they normally come part of the kits but i'm going to do it now so you can choose which of these scissors you'd like in the scissor cases so you can choose between all these scissor types now in the cases but you will be able to purchase all of these as separate pairs of scissors as well that makes sense with a scissor kit as well you get a needle and some bulb pin stitch markers if you buy the case with the actual um full kit but you'll be able to buy the scissors as a separate item now so i think that's all for today thank you so much for watching don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more and i shall see you in the next episode bye